Amen. One, two. It's a privilege to be here today. Amen. It's been a few years. We had two and a half years of weirdness. Amen. As, as you know, amen. It's been a privilege to come back to the Midlands. Amen. And minister here. Um, there's people I remember here. And there's some people that are new here. We're glad to have you here. Amen. It's good to be in church. Amen. Hallelujah. It's, um, it's a wonderful thing. I thank God for establishing the church. I mean, a church is more than church. It's family. Amen. When we get saved. Amen. Thank God for every single one of you being here. Thank God. I know Pastor Leon is in, um, is in Bonjour land. Amen. <laughs> amen. Praise God. Appreciate you. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning. Felt to minister this message, amen, out of um, Proverbs 26, verse 2. There was a story about a woman who had four children, and all of them had been girls, and she was pregnant with the fifth child. The day of delivery came, and she did not know the gender of the child. After delivering the child, the doctor came up to her, and said, congratulations, ma'am. You have a beautiful baby girl. The mother replied, I don't want that thing. Take her and keep her. How you know what this woman had done to this young child was activate a curse on the baby's life. Later in life, when the girl grew older, she began to struggle to find a good job because nobody wanted to, to, to deal with a thing. She started dating and every man would abandon her because they didn't want to have a thing. She was engaged to marry and on the wedding day, the groom didn't turn up. Because they regarded her as a thing. Here was a woman who was struggling in life but didn't understand why. Reason why she couldn't understand as a baby because her mother through her words had released a curse into her life. I mean her words are powerful. Words can change the course of someone's life, can set someone's life for good or for evil. You see, this curse was now working in her life. What is a curse? The devolution is a solemn, sincere, earnest utterance intended to evoke a supernatural power to afflict harm or punish on or something or someone's life. This morning I want to preach a sermon entitled Stopping Curses. Amen. Out of Proverbs 26, verse 2. Let's read. The Bible says, let me make it larger. Getting older. Like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. Let's pray. Father, we pray for your grace. Help me to minister with wisdom, compassion, and empathy. We pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will take my words and penetrate it to hearts, setting the captive free. Hide me behind the cross. Let Jesus be glorified. Every distraction we rebuke. We claim the loss. We claim the backslider. And we pray that you will take absolute, total control over this sub-morning service. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Stopping curses. I want to talk about the reality of curses. Like our text, like flying birds flying around. How many know a bird can't land on your head unless you allow it? Amen. <coughs> so a curse without cause cannot affect you. Many people think someone could just cast a curse and it will just come upon you. No, a curse has to have a cause. There has to be an open door for a curse to come into your life. You see, the reality is there are curses and inherited curses that is our responsibility to identify. We cannot ignore them because they have a potential to harm you and I, like in this woman in my illustration. 
so much as we would like to dismiss it, curses, and some people say curses are not real. How many of you know they are a reality? They may be blatant in third world nations, but it's so true in the West. It's just covered over with shirt and ties. Come on, somebody. Back home, they'll tell you, I'm going to curse you. The curse in the Greek word is the word katara, which literally means to bring down, to belittle, to undermine, to diminish, to cause to be unable. That's what that word means. In the Garden of Eden, the Bible says the devil had sinned in heaven, cursed and thrown out of heaven, and he came down to inflict the same chaos that came upon his life. And how many know he won that battle when he tempted Adam and Eve to sin against God? As a result of men's disobedience, there is a curse release upon mankind and creation. In Genesis 3.16, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception in pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. That word desire, and you might think, wow, he, she likes her husband. No, that word desire means she will try to control the man. Try to dominate and manipulate the man. So that was the curse that was released. And it talks about he shall rule over you, meaning that men were going to use their authority to dominate women in harsh and wicked ways. And we've seen that through centuries. And that was released because of sin. In Genesis 3, 7, curse is the ground for your sake to toil, to, and toil you shall eat of all of it all the days of your life. Verse 7, 19, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust to dust you are, and dust you shall return. In other words, because of men's disobedience, life was now going to contain certain struggles. Why is it whenever you want to progress, there are people that are happy for you and there are people not happy for you? Why is it when you want to push forward in life, there seems that thorns and thistles, theoretically, are coming against your life? I remember working for the Crown Prosecutioner. Uh, when I started, I started in the magistrate section. I got to understand how cases are built up from scratch and how, wh why certain cases go to court and why certain cases fail to go to court. Long story. Anyway, I remember when I started, I was called what you call organized chaos, meaning my paperwork was everywhere, but I knew where everything was. But when I go lunch, nobody had a clue. But over time, through that place, I learned to organize. How I many know there's hope for every situation? <laughs> I became more organized. Today, i more organized. I hate clutter. In fact, my wife is a blessing to me. She's super organized. When she was doing a, a birthday surprise for me, she, she started six months in advance. And she planned it. I'll go to Australia, come back jet lag, and she'll start doing deals in my face. But I'm so out of it, I didn't know what was going on. That's how super organized she was. But anyway, over time, I got promoted, and I went into, the, went into where we deal with higher cases, the Crown Court cases. So I came in there with the organization of the magistrate's department where I was, very organized. When we came into the, um, um, the Crown Court department, the place was chaotic. It was so disorganized. So I brought my skills of learned organization into the department and revolutionize the place by the help of God. And in three months, I got promoted as manager. Some people were happy and some long-term people were not happy. And they became thorns and thistles in my side and gave me hell. I mean, no, that's what the Bible says. Because of the curse, there are certain struggles that are going to come when you try to succeed or break through in life. Life is going to contain certain struggles because of a curse that is at work. You see, I wish to say that it was only Adam who was going to sweat and work hard. Come on, somebody. 
Adam, you sinned. Let the rest of us have reprieve. I wish to say there was only Eve who was going to bear children in pain. The pain came as a result of sin. Come on, somebody. Childbearing was meant to be painless. Working was meant to be painless. But because of disobedience, it released another reality into creation that you and I are facing today, even though it's thousands of years ago. See, the reality is these curses are work even today. In Romans 5, 12, 13, therefore, just through one man, Adam was our representative for the human race. We still see that today. I mean, on game shows, you have one representative. If they get it right, everyone benefits. If they get it wrong, everyone fails. Come on, amen. It happens in life. Through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and this thus death spread to all men, because all sin. You must say, well, I didn't sin like I didn't sin like Adam. Why am I paying the price? He was our representative. When he sinned, his spirit died. He was separate from God, and that death was passed from children to children to children. Like when you plant grapes with the seed grape will come up. You take that seed and you plant it again. More grape. It will produce its kind. So Adam's generation produced its kind. Men and women that are separate from death. Many people, well, he didn't die. He died spiritually. Eventually, it, uh, eventually he died physically. You see an even more degeneration today. Not just death. You see, why do people sin really? Because it's a work, curse at work from Daddy Adam and Mommy Eve. Their decisions made us a thing, so to speak. But even though today people want to be a thing, call me it, call me they. Come on, somebody. God made you, God didn't make you a it, He gave you identity. Come on, somebody. Call me a thing. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have a curse from them, but also our biological mom and dad, their disobedience can release a curse in our lives. That wants to work in our lives today. Exodus 24 and 6. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, are your God, Lord your God. I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my I've read this text so many times. Listen to me. The children of Israel came out from a land that was full of idolatry. They were there for 400 or 400 years observing the customs and the practice of the Egyptians. They had gods of all, all things, gods of the, of the rivers, god of the stars and the moons. And the Israelites saw this for generations after generation. God comes uh, and he delivers them through the hand of Moses. He begins to dispel to them the Ten Commandments. And he says to them, guys, listen, what you learned in Egypt... I don't want you to practice while you serve me. You, what you saw, the practice and the custom, do not do the same. Because God knows, amen, you know, I always say, the devil cannot force you, but he can tempt you. And when he tempts you, that's when you, you end up in the place where you can get judgment. So they've come out, and God said, listen, I'm a different God. I'm a God above all gods. There's none unlike me. And he told them, listen, don't practice it. He said, oh, that's what happens is, how many know we pass down what we know to our children? So God is saying to the third and fourth generation, because what happens? You get someone who's a Hindu, he passes his customs and values to his children. 
You got some of the Muslim passes his customs and values to his children. And it goes on from generation to generation. And God says, what happens? Because when you serve these idols, the natural flow is you're going to pass it down to the generation. You're going to pass down how they're going to worship the idol. You're going to pass down their practices. And what that does, it opens up a curse for you and a curse for the generations going down. But the ones who break it is the ones who turn from idolatry. And he said, when you follow me, the natural flow is you're going to pass down your customs and your practice of how you worship me to the next generation. And that brings blessing. But God said, don't practice that. Let me know the reality is if we because of disobedience there is a curse that goes down generationally. Whether we like it or not. Secondly, we need to identify a, work, a curse at work. Like the struggles that this woman in our illustration was having, people go through the same things without identifying it could be a curse at work against your life. Thankfully, this woman was able to identify that. But many people never ever seem to understand that something far at work than your daily struggles could be at work. No doubt. We think about Moses, but how many know Moses had the anger problem? But you've got to trace back his generations. Moses, we believe, do you believe he was a man of God? The spirit, he went and with his rod, he opened the Red Sea. Moses said, God, show me your glory. God said, let me hide you behind the cleft rock and you will see my back. Come on, somebody. Because if anyone saw God, they'll fry to smithereens. Come on, somebody. So God was being very nice to him. He said, you just see my back, Moses. And all he saw was fire. Come on, amen. But Moses, even though he's a man of God, has struggled with anger. And how sadly, it prevented him from going to the promised land. The Bible says he was the meekest man. That word meek means broken man. Meek. That's what it is, broken, meek, power under control. But how many know in life people can tick you off? Come and talk to me. My natural weakness, where the devil tries to exploit, is anger. Because I came from a broken home, didn't have a dad who could affirm me as a man and teach me as a man how to control my emotions. But when you get saved, you go through the process of discipleship that teaches you how to be a man, how to control yourself, how to be disciplined. Amen. Come on, somebody. And so I went through that process, but I know hell exploits. I remember one time I was coming from a trip, and I said, God, help me with my anger. When you pray those prayers, you know, back in the day, I was so naive. I thought when you pray those prayers, God, help me to love people. I thought the heavens would open up and, and love We'll be flying from the sky. I used to think that. It would go into my heart. And I love everybody. But I didn't know God creates scenarios where you have to exercise your will with his grace. Come on, somebody. So anyway, I came back from trip. I was, tra I was traveling. And I was looking on the board of where my gate was going to be. And, you know, I got on the plane. I got off. My wife was picking me up at Stansted Airport. I was there when she came. My daughter was young at the time. She parked up. My daughter vomited. She was trying to clean up the mess. I was coming out with my suitcase and somehow I had a hanger with me. And I came out and the security guard, hey, you need to move out of the way. Hey, hey, hey. God, no compassion. No empathy. No looking at the situation. Say, you know what? These people are in trouble. Let's give them grace. Hey, you. you. I tell I switched. I said, who are you talking to like that? I'm expressive, so my hanger is moving around, and I accidentally tap him. He said, hey, hey, this is him. Hey, assault. I said, don't try it, brother. <laughs> and so I'm going, ah, eventually we get in the car. My wife says, what's the matter with you? Ah! And I realized it was a test. But I failed. Come on, somebody. 
I just pray, God, help me my anger problem. A situation was presented and I failed. How many know when you're on the test, the teacher goes silent? Come on, they don't tell you when it's going to happen. Anyway, there was another one. I remember Asda. I was looking for, I think, cartridge for ink. And I asked one woman, and I said, do you know where the, the ink is? She said, I think it's over there, but I'm not sure if there's one there. So I went over there trying to find out. And so I went to her again. I said, where exactly is this? She said, I told you it was there. I said, raw. Don't you dare. Anyway, when I walked up, I heard there was a test. I mean, you never know. <laughs> Come on, somebody. But God's really helped me. <laughs> Moses, he's leading about 1.52 million people. They come of Egypt, and now they're thirsty. People start complaining. Moses, Moses, why did you take us back to Egypt? It was better. There was a synchrony of different voices, deep voices. Take me back to Egypt. Take me back to Egypt. Take me back to Egypt. Imagine all of them combined. How many know that drive you insane? I tell you what it's like. It's like when you have a child. Mom, 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 dad, 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 I want that, I want that, 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 Like Moses was getting it from grown ups. They're moaning and complaining, moaning and complaining. I mean, people can tire you. So here we have Moses. God says, listen, Moses, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know these people are complaining, get on your nerves, but don't worry, we're going to provide water. Moses, what I want you to do is I want you to speak to the rock and water will come out. But they drove him insane. Ah, okay, I'll show you guys. He got the rock. Bah! Water gushed out. And God said, because you didn't honor me, with your exampleship before the people, you're not going in. And see, the rock was a picture of Jesus being beat by the rod, which ushered in through salvation the Holy Spirit to refresh the people of God. But God didn't want him to beat the rock. So Moses, so God said, because of what you've done, it has, it has, a viol it has a hindered you from going to the promised land. Certain things we can do can derail us from destiny if we're not careful. But you see, you've got to understand, where did Moses get his anger from? In Exodus 2, 1 and 3, And a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when he, she saw that he was a beautiful child, Moses, she hid him three months. You see, Levi was the son of Jacob, who together with Simeon had avenged their sister Dinah, who had been raped. In Genesis 34, 25, 26, now it came to pass on the third day, when they were in pain, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brother, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Heber and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Jonah and took Dinah from Shechem, his house. Here we are, his sister being raped. They told the men, you can read in the chapters before, what they did in order to feel the pain. When the men were in pain, they came upon them. Basically, they took matters into their own hands. This is why if you allow anger to fester, now, this is why God says, let me take vengeance. Because when I take vengeance, I give the right proportion of justice to the offense. But when you take it, you go overboard. This is, come on, amen. Even when we finish dealing with them, we're still dealing with them. We see them, what the, what's wrong with you, man? That's us. And God said, I know the right measure to give justice. You don't because it's your broken nature through sin. All right? So, you know, man, this is why David, when he was tempted to count his men, God said, don't count the men because he didn't want them to trust him to trust in the arm of the flesh. He, there was battles going on. He didn't want, oh, yeah, I got 10,000 people, man. We can whip them. God didn't want him to. He just wanted him to go to battle with, 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 with the lack of knowledge of how much men he had so they were trusting God. 
But the Bible says Satan put, um, uh, uh, entered in and, and he uh, uh, fought in him and he went and counted. And God said, because of that, you got three options. I can hand you to your enemies. I can bring famine or I'll deal with you. And David was wise. He says, God, I prefer you deal with me. Because he knows that God gives a, a perfect justice to the perfect crime. If he left it with his enemy, they'll beat him, turn him over, and return him over. Come on, amen. Men would have gone beyond what was right. But God said, so David said, no, Lord, I'd rather be in your hands. Because I know you, you bring the right amount of justice. And after that, you are compassionate, merciful God. While men are immerciful. Come on, somebody. They went and took matters into their own hands. You see, Jacob will say of Moses' ancestors in Genesis 49, 5, 7. Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty, are in their dwelling place. Let, me, let my soul not enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man. And in self-will, listen to that. Their hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it's fierce, and their wrath for its cruel. I would divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Esau. Moses, this element of anger was working through Moses' ancestors, which worked through Moses. And sadly, he lost, went to heaven, but lost the destiny of leading the children of Israel into the promised land. We have Ruth. She was the great grandmother of David. Ruth was a Moabite woman. These people were birthed through incest. When Lot came out of Sodom and Gomorrah, where do you think his children learnt this behavior? By watching people practice it in Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it's no different to our generation. But what pe the filth people watch today. Come on, somebody. I mean, uh, what you input is going to be output. You might say, well, I'm watching it. It doesn't influence me. Yes, it does. It will influence you one or the other. Come on, somebody. They were watching all kinds of acts in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. They came out. They thought we would never marry. Let's make our dad drunk and have kids from our dad. Where did they get that kind of information? Through Sodom and Gomorrah. See, the Moabites were a moral people, and guess what? David comes from that, that, that root. Is it no wonder every woman David met, he wanted to marry them? Bathsheba. When kings go to war and he should be on outreach. I mean, oh, there's a season to rest and there's a season to fight. It was season when kings go to war. But he's chilling. Who knows? Me and my friend were talking about it the other day. Who knows? Maybe it wasn't the first time he saw Bathsheba. Maybe the first time he always run, he ducked and hide. But this time he's chilling. Maybe he's wary. I mean, oh, when you're spiritually wary, you are susceptible to temptation. So he's chilling. And he goes out, he's bored, he walks out. And again, I always say, who baths outside? <laughs> but it does make sense, because where I'm from, Ghana, my dad's estate, they had showers that were outside, but they had cubicles, and they had a building you can go and change. But thankfully, there was no upstairs, so people, no peeping toms. Come on, amen. So I, I can kind of gauge the picture. Maybe David, he went and looked out. They say, your first look is not your fault. But the second look is a choice. Maybe he looked, uh, you know, no, no, no. I should not covet thy neighbor's wife. But you know what, God, I'm just admiring. <laughs> you liar! <laughs> and he looked, 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 lost. His eyes lost. His eyes went, gong, 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 and bows back up. And he said, hey, he was infatuated. Infatuation that is dangerous. So anyway, he's infatuated, he's looking. He calls her, hey, who's, who's this? Ah, uh, Bathsheba. And God always gives a window of escape. 
Because they said, this is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Um, David should have woke up. My goodness, what the heck am I doing? Why am I lusting after someone else's wife? Doesn't the commandment, thou shall not lust, covet thy neighbor's wife? You know, let me run for my life. But it was too late. It was so ingrained. And so, you know, he sleeps with Bathsheba. You know the story. He goes and murders Uriah, tries to get Uriah to drunk and try to cover his tracks uh, by getting Uriah to sleep with his wife so, he could say, so she could say, Uriah, guess what? I'm pregnant to cover his tracks. But Uriah was too much of a loyal man. He said, why should I take pleasure when my brothers are out there fighting the Lord's battles? But look at this. It worked through David. God through kings told the kings, do not multiply your wives. But David disobeyed that commandment. Because God understands, listen, one wife is enough. One wife, one husband is enough. There's enough tribulation that comes with that. <laughs> Just work with the one tribulation you have, not multiple. Come on, somebody. That's what Paul says. He says, if you marry, you know, some people think, if I get married, you know, magic will happen. Boom, I change. No, it only highlights the good, the bad, and the hogly inside of you that needs to be changed. Come on, amen. Let me, as soon as I put the ring, some supernatural power come. Whom? No, that's when the work begins. Come on, amen. That's when you both begin to excavate each other's character so you can change. And it gets better, sweeter. You grow together. Grow, it's called growing pains. Amen. <laughs> But it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Some people, I, I just get married. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good to get married. Amen. It's good. So, but don't think you, I get married all of a sudden. Because yeah, you know, I think some people like the event of marriage, the actual marriage. Come on, somebody. They're like, mm, everyone's clapping there. Yeah. But you gotta sail the boat and work on your relationship while everyone goes home and eats their jollof rice. And, and come on, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But these elements started to work in Solomon. Think with me. David had three, four wives. Solomon took her to another level. See, our compromise as parents becomes our children's convictions. Because Solomon didn't have three to four wives. He had 700 wives. And 300 concubines, sexual partners. Talked about unbridled lust. He said, if you read Ecclesiastes, wherever my eyes desired, I didn't hold back. He was driven by desire. He was bound by his desire. He was a slave to his desire. And the Bible says, yes, seven of wives. Maybe he went to the first wife. Hey, Bethany, how are you? It's not Bethany, it's Betty. He's forgotten. Come on, somebody. And the Bible says that the woman drew him away from serving God. Each one of them had their own gods. This is why hell, you know, they say uh, um, the way to a man's, be a man's life is his belly. When woman could, Why do you think Satan attacked Eve? Because he knew he couldn't get Adam on a logical level. So he got Eve on an emotional level. Come on, somebody. And he knew that Eve would be able to convince her husband. Come on, somebody. So why is he, he does the same to Solomon? He gets the woman, he marries them, and he turns his heart against God. And the kingdom of God gets split in half. But thank God, when you read Ecclesiastes, you can see that Solomon, some, somewhere along, turned back. Because he says, remember your creator when you're old. That tells me he got back on track. Because God is a good God. Come on, somebody. It's not surprising to find a young woman whose mother got pregnant at 17 and those elements were working in her daughter. My friend's brother impregnated his girlfriend at 17, 16, 17, and his daughter the same, 16, 17. It's a curse at work. Can somebody hear me tonight? I mean this up morning, sorry. You see some young men finding themselves at certain ages and seasons Flooded with sexual temptation, overwhelmed, saturation of lust. Where's that coming from? Could be working through your fathers, working through you.
How about finances? Entire families poor. No one graduated from high school. No one has worked from generation to generation. It's a curse at work. Sickness. Constant battle with health issues. You overcome one sickness, another one comes. And you and your family, it's a curse at work because when you look back in your history, the same pattern has happened through generations because that's a curse at work. There's a pattern. I'm not talking about the one off here and there. There's a pattern, a repeated pattern. It could be a curse at work. Drug and alcohol addiction. Your great granddad was a drunk or addicted to drugs and violent towards your great grandmother. Your dad had the same problem, and you and your son, and, and, and you, the son or daughter, trying to work its way through your life. It could be a curse at work. Jeremy Meeks, who you know Jeremy Meeks? He's dating a girl called Chloe, Chloe Green, whose dad was Philip Green, who had BHS stores, John Lewis, and sold BHS stores when it was going down for one pound, and everyone lost their pension. Remember that? Chloe Green hooks up with a guy, Jeremy Meeks, green-eyed, light-skinned brother. Before he was a model, he was a gangster. All right? He had been jailed on weapons charges and gang-related offences. But listen, it all started with his father, Ray Meeks, who spent 33 years in jail for rape. His mother, Catherine Meeks, was spent time behind bars. His brother, Emery Meeks, has been in trouble with the law. His sister, Camilla de Jesus, Jesus has been convicted of minor offences. You may say, what is behind this family? It's a curse of rebellion that is working through that family. And all of them has had trouble with the law. It's a curse. Can you hear me tonight? See, many times, you see, we must identify a curse at work. We must break it. Gain dominion over our marriage, finances, whatever. I mean, no, idolatry releases curses. In Germany, I was doing a revival. A woman came. You can see those fearful, worried lines in her head. I said, what's the matter? I got a brother to translate because she couldn't speak English. And he said, she said that at home, she sees objects fly from her table and fly to the other side. I said to her, do you have idols in your house? She said, yes. And the disciple told me earlier on, we've told them many times, get rid of the idol. But how I many some people are stubborn? They see all these movements. Nah, nah, I want to keep it because it's sentimental. That sentimental thing could be blessed by a voodoo doctor that your grandparents didn't, was ignorant about and give it to you. Come on, somebody. So I told her, we prayed, we broke his power. I said, you need to go home and plead the blood around your house and cast out the idols out your house. She, she obeyed, came to church, lifting her hands, totally free, different countenance, because God says, I will not share my glory with nobody else. If you have idols, it will bring a curse into your house. It will bring oppression, depression, repression. It will bring, it opens doors for a can of demons to operate in your house. That's what people don't understand. If you've got pictures of Jesus, if you've got Jesus on the cross, cast it out. Because you can't say to the devil, Satan, I'll bind you. And Satan said, well, I can't leave because you've got my toys. There are legal functions in the spiritual realm. Just we have uh, natural legal laws. There's spiritual laws that when you, and the devil knows these laws. He knows how to tempt us to violate those laws so we can be cursed. Come on, somebody. You understand, there are laws. There's relational laws. Come on, amen. Pastor Greg Mitchell said, all sin will take you to hell. But there are specific sins that carry specific curses to it. They say children born out of wedlock, illegitimate birth has serious spiritual and physical consequences. 
Medical research indicates that any, many Ill illegitimate children under, uh, suffer from deafness in one ear, respiratory problems, allergies, sinuses, asthma, and the list is endless. They say promiscuity in women can cause cervical cancer. I mean, no, sin is no joke. Sexual immorality brings a curse. Fatherless children, hungry young children with no father figures. They say shacking up before marriage releases a curse. This was studies done by unsaved people. Studies by unsaved people said between 65 to 80 percent of divorces are those who shacked up before marriage. You can't mess with sin. Come on, somebody. Because fornication and sex outside of marriage brings a curse into the relationship. Studies have shown that those who keep away from sex before marriage have a stronger bond when they get married. This is unsaved people saying this. In fact, an unsaved documentary um, uh, article said that shacking up is bad for your health. That this, is, uh, this is people who are not even saved. They're realizing that what the Bible speaks about is true, even though they don't give credit to the Bible. They said when two people shack up, they are apprehensive whether in a year they're going to be with the same partner. He said you don't get that when people are married. He said when they go out, they don't feel the obligation to be faithful. But he said that when people, I'm not saying I, I'm, I'm married, married people don't, but he said it's not as much. In fact, one man said, before you get married, the devil's trying to put you together. And when you're married, he's trying to split you apart. It's true. <laughs> Come on, somebody. They said that there's, there's no... My next door neighbor, was in, when I was living in Layton, so was with his girlfriend for 14 years. They get married. I go confront. I come back, I was pioneering breath, I came back. Hello, how you doing? After two to three years, they split up for divorce. 14 years, you should have been married from then. Come on, somebody. Because God says, listen, the reason I put these boundaries is the protection for you. I want you lasting relationship. It's like the sellotape. Let me know, they say your first person it's like, how I many know the first stick? It sticks. And it's hard to take off. But when you take it off and you keep sticking it everywhere, I mean, no, it loses its stickability. <laughs> they said the first person you, you stick, you bond. But when people play around, the time they want to stick together in a relationship, they can't stick no more. Come on, somebody. This is why God says, Keep it, listen, it, God's laws are so simple. Keep it simple. Keep it locked to marriage. Come on, amen. You want lasting and, and the, the, don't worry, there's hope in this sermon, don't worry. There's hope. If you're the sellotape, don't worry, there's hope for you. God can bring that stickability back. All right? <laughs> I want to talk about stopping curses. Hallelujah. We're there. Hang it. If you don't have a revelation of curses, you will find yourself in the same situation over and over and over again. We must stop curses, especially those passed down from affecting our lives. I remember I asked my mom, I said, what was my dad like? I only remember my dad for one thing. He beat me, and I deserved it. It was in Ghana, you know? So I noticed he chased me around the compound. I was running like Hussein Bolt. Hid in the bush, dragged me out. Kana, kana, pa, ta, ka, bang! I tell you what, it didn't damage me. It just made me respect elders. Come on, somebody. It didn't mess me up here. Anyway, there's a story about a league game, a, a baseball game. A coach said to one of his young players, do you understand what cooperation is? What a team is? The little boy nodded in affirmative. 
Do you understand what matters is whether we win together as a team? The little boy nodded yes. So the coach continued, when a strike is called, you are not, you are, and you are out at first. You don't argue or curse or attack the empire. Do you understand? Yes. He said, great. Go and explain that to your mother. Don't you get it? The kid was arguing with the empire, wanted to fight them, and so was the mum. So he said, go and explain what I've explained to you to your mum. Like mother, like son. Come. <laughs> We've got to undo the ways of our forefathers. In Genesis 25, 1 and 12, it says, Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife, because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, con conceived. Think with me. Isaac understood what was taking place. There was delay. If you look at his forefathers, Abraham delay. Jacob delay. It took him seven year, 14 years to get the lady of his dreams. Delay. Laban changed his wages 10,000 times. Come on, amen. See, this is just deeper than just your wife not falling pregnant. Sometimes there could be a curse at work. In Matthew 12, 43 and 45, it says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goeth through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from where I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So shall I be with this wicked generation? Jesus said when I cast, when a spirit or curse is cast out your life, that spirit goes through looking for dry, uh, another human being. That's what it's looking for. Pastor Greg said demons want a human body or they want to hide behind religious objects. Right? So if you can't, uh, you know, let me go back to my house. He comes back to the house and sees the house swept clean and in order. It's a picture when you get saved, God puts your life in order. But when your life is in order, it doesn't stop there. You've got to fill it with Jesus. Fill it with the works of God. And what some people do, they get delivered and they just, oh, that's it. My life is clean. I don't got need to do nothing else. The spirit comes back and sees that the life is not occupied with Jesus' business. And so what he does, he says, you know what, hey, hey guys, let's go back in the house. We're going to have a party. <laughs> and they come back, the demon doesn't want to be cast out again. So it comes back with more wicked spirits to reinforce its dominion. And the bondage gets worse. And God says, this will be the wicked general. How many people say, repent, go back into sin. Come back, repent, go back into sin. They're reinforcing bondage, which becomes more difficult. They said, this generation will be like this. But I want to tell you tonight that there is hope this morning. Although there may be a curse at work in your life and in your children, it can be broken by the blood of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.13, but Christ has re rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on a cross, he took upon himself the curse of our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Listen, Jesus took the curse of your forefathers to the curse of my wrongdoing, the curse that I've released in my life. And it was nailed to a tree tonight. He became a curse so that God's blessings could be flowing into our lives. So deliverance could be flown in, brought into our lives this morning. Can somebody say amen? Jesus took upon ourselves, amen, so that you and I can repent and undo the ways of our forefathers. Just because he died, it's not automatic. You have to appropriate what he's done on the cross to your situation, to your life. Can somebody hear me? There is freedom this morning in Jesus' name. For you to have freedom, 
You need to change your mind. Say, you know what? God, you might be ignorant. It's good to ask the Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, is there anything my forefathers or I've done any open door? I tell you, God will show you. And you can find freedom. Amen. We thank God for that baby. Amen. Amen. We must pray and identify and pray against. I'll close with this. One pastor was having tremendous headaches. And he didn't know why. So he invited an evangelist to come over. The evangelist was praying under his breath. God, you know, show us if anything. And he's, he's probing the guy, probing the pastor. And then the pastor said, one sec. He, he realized there's something he was given. It was in the loft. He went in the loft. They brought it down. It was a carved image with some writing on it. And they identified it had been blessed by a voodoo doctor. But he didn't know it was just a gift given by a holiday. They prayed, broke the curse, threw it out, never had migraine headaches again. We need to identify what we've opened in our lives, what our forefathers, because even though you're saved, there's still things that need to be renounced. Just because Christ has died, things there needs to be appropriation to certain of his benefits. It ain't just going to happen. I mean, just because Jesus died, is everyone getting saved? They have to ask for it. Come on, somebody. This morning, we want to break some curses in your life so you can be free and experience the blessings of Abraham. Do you want that tonight? Amen. Every head bow, every eye close. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning, and the curse of 